everyone. <clears throat> I'm a research fellow here and the director of a new digital assets policy project that we have begun to organize events like this and get the Kennedy School more involved in the discussion of digital assets public policy. And I encourage you to uh, go to our website at the Mosava Romani Center for Business and Government and see what's coming up. And also we have recordings of some past events uh, as well. <clears throat> I am just thrilled that we have Jay Clayton today. Jay, as you know, was the uh, chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission from 2017 to early December one or De December of December, 20? December of 20. December of 20. Um, and uh, I have actually known Jane, uh, Jay for a couple of decades since we were both practicing lawyers. So I knew even before he took the job that he would do a great job uh, there. And um, we have also um, done a little bit of collaborating on the subject that we're going to talk about today. So while he was uh, appointed by Trump and I was appointed by Obama, um, I was at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission uh, before. Uh, our views uh, often um, are the same. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Jay. I will maybe save my, well, I may interrupt you once or twice, but otherwise I'll save my questions for the end and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions. Yeah, well, well thank you. And uh, you preceded me in public service and, and, and did, a, uh, did a fabulous job, both, both at the CFTC and at Treasury. Um, so look, look, we'll make this as interactive as, as we can. Uh, I'll just start with a few remarks about crypto and let me just give an outline. A little bit about the technology, very little bit about the technology, um, some background on how we got here. I don't think anyone would say where, where here is, is totally satisfactory. Um, some recent developments and then what we should think about doing going forward in order to improve the situation. So. Unfortunately, a lot of people view crypto as a product. Crypto is actually a technology. You can call it crypto, you can call it distributed ledger, you can call it blockchain. It, it, it is a form of technology at its most rudimentary level for recording rights. Think about it that way. And in a ledger that is more efficiently audible than many current technologies that we use for such things. So for example, property deeds. Why on earth do we have to go down to the local courthouse or some other government entity and look in paper filings for whether someone owns a home or not and establishing chain of title and the like when there is a technology available that is far superior? It's a technology that can be used for that, technology that can be used for a lot of financial transactions, technology that can be used for non-financial transactions. How did we get here in the financial world? Okay. Um, I think there's a couple of things. First, the US in particular has a very two-tiered approach to financial products. If you are a retail person, you, you benefit from incredibly rigorous protections, most rigorous in the world by far. Um, whether it's securities, payments, credit, anything, the rigor with which we protect our retail participants almost knows no bounds. It's actually worked pretty well. Okay. Um, if you're an institution, it's actually pretty light touch regulation. Um, just understand that difference. So to, to illustrate that difference, think about public companies. Public companies are public because they want to raise money from everyone. They want to do it without a personal relationship. They'd like to facilitate sec secondary trading because secondary trading allows you to raise money earlier, easier in a primary offering. Um, you have to be, nowadays, a company of the size of at least two, three, four billion dollars 
before it makes any sense to take on the regulatory burden of being a public company. Okay, so what does that mean for retail investors? Your investment opportunities are essentially limited to large companies, which is a large dollar amount, but a limited set of investment opportunities. So we have a two-tiered system. Institutional investors can invest in any size company. Um, hold that thought. Um, crypto comes along and it is attractive. It is at the retail level. And what has often happened in innovation in American finance is it has happened at the institutional level. Almost all innovation has occurred at first at institutions and then has been distributed to retail. Crypto comes along and it is presented to retail people as an alternative. Think of Bitcoin. And it catches on first in the retail sector and not in the institutional sector. Why is that so important? We regulate we, we impose that very rigorous regulation through institutions. No one sits next to a retail person and says, let me help you buy or sell stock. What we do is we go and we re very rigorously regulate the companies, the brokers, the investment advisors, and we make them protect the individual. Well, if you're marketing Bitcoin directly to an individual, you're skipping all of those intermediaries. So it gets traction in the retail community in a way that no other financial innovation technology has before. Second thing is it's global, not local. It comes from offshore. So if it had been domestic, it might have been easier, although it was direct to retail, to police. But when it's coming from offshore and, and disaggregated, very difficult to police. When I was running the SEC, I used to tell people, you send your money outside the United States, there is very little I can do to get it back. Even, you know, we can go prove fraud. We can, you know, basically have, have all of the, what I would say is all of the judgments you want. Good luck in getting your money back. Okay, that's just the way the world, the SEC does not have gunboats to send to, you know, wherever to get someone their money back. So it emerged at a retail level and globally rather than at an institutional level and domestically. Um, next thing about crypto that was different is they had, the proponents of crypto had what I would call the Uber, as in the car, as in the ride sharing company perspective. Their idea was, look, US regulation is so rigorous around raising money from the public this technology is so good that US regulation will actually bend, US financial regulation will bend to the technology, just like US livery taxicab regulation bent to the technology. So the attitude was just go fast and break things because that had worked in the past. What was missed is that in the taxicab area, you know, the regulation actually did not make a lot of sense. Um, it wasn't about protecting the customer. It was about protecting the taxi cab companies. Here, the regulation was about protecting the customer. So it was a different area and a, a different perspective. And um, with what I would say Uber, didn't change the seat belts. You didn't change whether you had to have a license in the car. You didn't change any of those fundamentals. Crypto was changing the fundamentals of you didn't get financial statements if you were investing. You didn't get disclosure. You didn't get a responsible party stepping up. There were none of the basic protections of the public securities laws were there. And then the last thing we had was euphoria. Um, and there was euphoria around crypto as a technology. There was euphoria around the amount of money people were making. Um, you know, rose to $3 trillion at, at one point. So that's kind of the development in what I would say is 2014 through to say 2017, 18, 19, going into some of the
trading euphoria that happened around COVID. What, I, what I'll also say is that the global banking regulators had a view that crypto would die of its own weight. Not the security side of crypto, not the I, ICOs and the like, but Bitcoin and potential replacements for sovereign currencies and gold as a store of value. They very much had the academic view that we really don't need to do anything because this has no intrinsic value and it will die of its own weight. So global regulators were slow to see the need to regulate crypto. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I think you and I were, you and I were two of the people that were like, you got to deal with this. You got, you got to decide what you want to do because what you're able to do will be a product of the path we take. Okay, so that's sort of crypto. Um, what has happened recently, we've had a number of things that always happens when there's euphoria. Uh, FTX, uh, Three Arrows, the banks, uh, Silvergate, Signature. Um, some could even say that Silicon Valley Bank, um, its rapid growth in deposits was a result of the crypto phenomenon. Its rapid growth in deposits was one side of the coin that caused its collapse. Um, we've now had a regulatory crackdown. Uh, some would cynically say principally driven by the events at FTX, um, where the message is that we're going to keep crypto at arm's length from the traditional financial system. Um, and with all of that, what else is going on right now is the traditional financial system is looking at crypto or is looking at blockchain as a potential upgrade across the financial system um, that is probably long overdue. It, it does not make a lot of sense that it takes two and three and 10 and 15 days for transactions to settle in today's electronic world. And when interest rates were zero, that was not a lot of money. When interest rates are more normalized, it is a lot of money. Um, lastly, recent developments, I would say that while the US has become more crypto, um, I would say crypto adverse in the traditional financial system, there's been a flip-flop in the non-US financial centers who are now embracing digital assets um, as part of the next generation of financial products and next generation of technology. Abu Dhabi, um, Singapore, uh, I think you've even seen a flip-flop in Hong Kong, China uh, in the last six months. So while the US has pulled back, it appears that the rest of the world is at least trying to accommodate crypto as a technology. So with that, um, lots of people are a bit frustrated um, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that in America, um, I saw Mike Novogratz today on television. I think he was estimating that, you know, the, it's tens of millions of people in America hold crypto. And they are trading crypto on a regular basis. Um, so we, we have lots of crypto activity. We don't have very much crypto certainty. What, what do we do? There are some people who want comprehensive legislation, comprehensive reform, some kind of special regu regulator. That's not going to happen. Okay, it's just not going to happen. In many ways, because crypto is a technology, not a new product. It is a technology that may enable some new products, but in large part, it's a technology that delivers old, well-known products, already regulated products in a new way. We're not going to overhaul existing regulation in order to accommodate those few new products. That's also, there is a practical side to this, which is I don't see this Congress and this political makeup agreeing on a wide array of activities in order to have some kind of comprehensive crypto bill. I don't know, Tim, if you have a different view, but I think that the chances are remote at best. So what should we do? First thing we should do is we should recognize that there's the 30, 50, 60, whatever the number is, people who, who are trading crypto. Um, 
eliminating it is probably not good for them. Um, bringing trading um, more in line with traditional norms of trading is a good thing. Tim and I have both advocated for, look, if you're providing secondary trading services, either register with the SEC, which is difficult, and I'm not sure the SEC is making it any easier, register with the CFTC, or a third thing, which is take the basic principles of trading platforms and make sure that you're applying them while we sort out whether you should register with the SEC, the CFTC, or something else. Make, make an affirmative step here that while we figure out exactly where we want to land, you're protecting people who are trading um, in crypto and, and seeking to hold their, their assets. Going to the holding issue, tell people how they can effectively custody digital assets of all types for customers. Um, right now, if you have a security in, in digital asset form, it is not clear how a custodian would custody that security. It's clear how you would custody a paper security. It's clear how you would custody an entry at DTC or at a broker. It's not clear how you would custody a tokenized security. We, we can add clarity there. Last, I think that we've seen, and I'd be, I think Tim, you and I both agree on this, that not all stable coins are stable. That's clear, but the stable coin, what I would say is the stable coin functionality as a means to get in and out of crypto, but also to transmit money um, across borders, pretty darn effective, seems pretty promising. We can establish a safe harbor for what is a stable coin that is stable and not a security. So that financial institutions can start to incorporate stablecoin, if it makes sense, into everyday transactions. Those three things, heck, I'd settle for one out of three, but you know, those three things would be, I think, incremental steps forward, where we would then be able to see what the promise of this technology was across the financial system. There's. I'll just say, there are some people that thinks, think there's no doubt it is the future in almost every aspect of our financial networks. And there are some people who think that this technology is actually pretty old and really not going to add that much. My view is, well, let's see. But what we should not do is artificially keep the technology away from places where it's clearly safe. That's that's what I have to say. That's great. Um, I have a, a couple of thoughts that I'm pretty sure you agree with. First of all, I think I think your perspective on on the elements of how we got here retail it was retail it was global and also the perspective of the people in the industry is, is very important to keep in mind. Um, the other thing I think is is critical in how the U.S. got to where it is on this is that we have a fragmented regulatory system, meaning that we have lots of different financial regulators. We have the Securities and Exchange Commission, which regulates securities. We have the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which regulates commodities. We have multiple bank regulators who re regulate banks. We have state regulators. And so crypto was something insofar as it generated investments in financial products and financial technologies cut across all those categories. That made it very hard for our system to cope with it. Now, that is a common thing. I mean, innovation often occurs outside the regulatory perimeter and you're challenged then to figure out how it fits in. Other countries were at somewhat of an advantage where they had what we call a unitary financial regulator that had the ability to look across the entire system and say, I see this happening we need to deal with that and not worry about jurisdictional lines. The US coming out of the financial crisis sort of tried to create something like that in the Financial Stability Over Oversight Council, but not really, because its job was really just to look at what was happening and say, we see a problem over there, but it couldn't really, didn't really have the problem 
power to do anything. Um, and some countries have at least, they may have different regulators, but they at least have one market regulator as opposed to a bank regulator. So that made it a little bit easier, made them a little bit more nimble. So we've had that problem. I would say also to Jay's point about these competing views of the future, I think he and I also share the view that the job of market regulators, meaning the SEC and the CFTC, is not to say you should or should not invest in something. It's to create an environment where there is integrity and transparency in markets and let the market decide. So now we're in this place where, you know, you've heard no, no doubt about this. Is it a security? Is it a commodity? You know, and we both have some uh, responsibility for that in the sense that when I was at the CFTC, we declared Bitcoin was a commodity, but most people don't understand why we did that. That was because the definition of commodities, if you look at the law, lists all these things that you would think of as commodities. Cotton, gold, oil, whatever. But not onions. But not onions, that's true. That's a, <laughs> that's a diversion. I won't go down that road, but onions are excluded from the definition of commodity. They had good lobbyists. They didn't want to be in defined, and they later regretted that decision, that's all I'll say. But, um, what, but it also then says, and I'm paraphrasing, but it essentially says, and anything else on which a contract for forward delivery is offered, meaning a futures contract or a swap contract. So when people started coming into my office and saying, we're thinking about doing a Bitcoin swap, a swap is where you have two parties paying different amounts, like an interest rate swap or a cross-currency swap. We want to do a Bitcoin swap. We said, well, that would make Bitcoin a commodity. And so we said that, and we were upheld in court. And then there's issues on definition. Well, if Bitcoin is a commodity, is every crypto asset a commodity? Well, you can debate that. But in any event, that's what made it a commodity. Um, but then you look at a lot of these things, and then there's something called the Howey test, which no doubt you've heard of, which Jay had, had to focus on that, which determines whether it's a security. So now we're in this world where people love to debate this question. But I think one of the things that we agree on is that's the wrong question. No matter what bucket it's in, we need to raise the level of investor protection. And there are ways to do that without debating. The question. No, I, I agree. I think the classification question, security or commodity, has taken up an incredible amount of bandwidth when now, whoever you talk to, most of what's out there trading was a security at least at the time that it was offered. And we should recognize that. And, and what is trading, whether security or commodity, retail people are entitled to some basic protections. Like these should be traded on regulated platforms. You have that. And, and I don't think anybody can debate that. The question is how to get there. And that's what we have both proposed, which is register with the SEC, register with the CFTC, but we don't care, or follow the basic principles until we get some of these classification questions um, worked out. I'll, I'll even posit that you know, some people have added to the classification confusion in, in order to keep things going. Am ambiguity is a, is a great place to hide. We want to keep the status quo, right? And, and, and there are definitely people who have taken that strategy. Um, and one of the things Jay did in, in, in that regard was, you may recall in 2017, there was suddenly this rash of what were called ICOs, internet coin offerings, where people were offering tokens sale to the public on the basis of white papers that often didn't even tell you where the issuer was incorporated, had no financial information, of course, had very little information of any kind. A lot of them were fraudulent. And Jay basically ramped up the SEC enforcement team to go after those and say, these are illegal public offerings and shut it down and basically stopped that ICO wave. 
years. But again, that kind of, and people still wanted to focus on, yeah, but are all of them securities? We think some of them aren't secure. They, they, think about it this way. They were almost all very incipient stage venture offerings. That if you, if you went to any lawyer and said, I'd like to raise money for my venture free crypto, they'd say, okay, you need a venture funding round. You need to go to venture capitalists. You can't go to the public because you don't have enough information. You don't have enough history. You don't have enough of a lot of things in order to be able to access the public market. That's what they would be told. For some reason, the reasons being the ones I articulated, all of a sudden with a new technology, people thought we could ignore all that and just go ahead out to the public using the internet and using you know, crypto and say, okay, this is, this is different. It wasn't any different. Um, and the courts, the courts largely, I won't even say largely, to date have upheld basically everything we did in terms of shutting down that practice. Um, what's happening now is there's trading of tokens that have been out there. And the question is what, what's going to happen there? Um, that's a different, that is a different question because you do have all of these existing holders out there who, you know, whatever regulatory tax is taken will be benefited or will be harmed um, as a result of more or less liquidity, more or less information. It's not an easy, there's no, not, there's no perfect or easy answer, but that's where we are. And so today, you know, there's 20,000 tokens or something and people continue to issue them. They don't do it the way they did in 2017 with a flashy, you know, essentially public offering. They do it much more quietly. But then we have various trading platforms who then list some of those, although it's frankly a pretty small subset, only about 500 or 400, Kabir and I looked at recently. Um, and there's a and there's a conundrum here that has would not have been here 30 years ago, pre-internet, pre-global communications, pre-ability to send money around the world, which is you know, there's very little that you the U.S. can do about a U.S. person who wants to trade on an offshore exchange. Short of coming and saying, you know what, you can't do that. Um, which is pretty paternalistic. You have the possibility that all token trading will move to Abu Dhabi or move to London or move to Singapore and US people who want access to it will find a way to access it in those venues. Now, we've made that choice in the past around some things and said, you know what, we're just gonna try and limit access as much as possible for US retail folks. That is becoming a harder and harder thing to do. So Jay was referring to the failures we had last year and FTX is of course the one that just about everybody has heard of and uh, Sam Bankman freed. And there you had a trading platform which grew very, very quickly internationally, globally, that essentially it had different subsidiaries around the world, but basically most of those were not because even though other countries are ahead of us now in terms of developing frameworks, they didn't have those frameworks in place uh, to require registration, except in the case of Japan. Japan uh, had uh, some tougher restrictions on the FTX entity operating there because Japan was the location of the first big ex crypto exchange failure, Mt. Dox, which happened in 2014. In the US, there was an FTX US what we call spot market, meaning buy Bitcoin, buy Ether for cash. That was essentially not regulated. They did have a derivatives trading platform, which was regulated. And that's because the law on needing to register is very clear if you're Bitcoin futures or Ether futures. So that part was regulated. But to Jay's point about just getting custody rules in place would be a good thing. What a lot of people found out when FTX crashed was their money wasn't protected. Their, their assets weren't protected. And S FTX had commingled those with its own. It had lent them to an affiliate. The affiliate then made investments. And so people were out of luck and now they're standing in line and 
the bankruptcy, hoping to get something back. So again, where we're coming from is let's not try to kind of come up with something that redefines what's a security and what's a commodity for purposes of crypto, because not only is it difficult, but you might open up more problems than you're solving. You might find it in a certain way and then IBM comes along and says, you know what, I think I'll tokenize my stock. That rather than do that, create some basic standards that have to apply regardless of what you're trading to elevate the level of the protection. And, and one one thing of note, oh, let me let me let me just make sure I'm I'm clear on where I stand. I don't know whether Bitcoin will be worth right a hundred thousand dollars two years from now or a thousand dollars. I I actually don't even have a directional view. I'm not. I don't. I don't. I don't own it, I, yeah. but I'm not, I don't believe we should ban it. Right. I, I, like, I, like I feel like that's not the kind of choice that the government should be making for, right. you know, yeah. other and, people. And, and here's the example of why, right? Bitcoin came out. You might've thought Bitcoin was the greatest thing since sliced bread, or you might've thought this is complete fraud. But then what happened? Well, then Facebook, came along and said, hey, we've got an idea. It's called Libra, which was really the first big effort to create a stable coin. Stable coin meaning a crypto token, which is tied, its value is actually tied to something like the dollar and it's backed by the dollar. Well, they didn't get off the ground either for various reasons, but other stable coins are out there. And what Facebook did then led lots of central banks in the world to focus on central bank digital currencies, which China has now launched and other countries are looking at it. So you don't know where innovation is going. And I think we're both of the school of thought that says government can't predict that, shouldn't try to predict that. Create the conditions for markets that have integrity and transparency and consumer protection, where it goes. Yeah, and I, but I, I do expect we will have some form of digitized cash sooner rather than later. Right, right. My money is on the private sector, not the public sector to develop right. that. So where are we today? You know, there were, I think we were both more optimistic about maybe some legislative changes that might have occurred. I've written with uh, Hal Jackson at the law school and another Cornell law professor about ways that agencies could actually do things on their own without new legislation. Jay and I have also written on that in the Wall Street Journal. We think there's opportunities, but regulators have to be creative more so than they have been. Where we are is we're kind of in a phase where, you know, the regulators are using their power to bring enforcement cases and, and we're very supportive of enforcement cases. You know, there is a lot of lawlessness. Fraud, fraud's bad. Yeah, there is a <laughs> lot of lawlessness in this industry, but we don't think it's a sufficient solution. The, la the last thing that I'll say, having said all that is these debacles, these frauds, these, these bad behaviors. One thing of note is that it's really not the use of distributed ledger technology that has been the problem. In fact, it's been Excel spreadsheets. You know, what I would say is old school fraud around the crypto based or distributed ledger based product, which is actually quite interesting. Um, I think the, the auditability of these products is, is one of their uh, say very attractive features going forward. Um, so it wasn't the crypto aspect that failed. Um, it was the, the, the I mean, old school. What it means to trade on a trading platform. Mm -hmm. not trading. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, what I would say is the entries on the blockchain adjusting for who owns the particular asset, that is not where the problem was. The blockchain, think of it as being static. And then the underlying ownership recorded on an Excel spreadsheet. The Excel spreadsheet is where things went wrong. Right. So when you when you open your account at Coinbase and you buy Bitcoin or you sell Bitcoin, whatever, 
Nothing is happening on the blockchain. Just a Coinbase ledger account, the same way it would be at JP. And that ledger account, what we're saying is, should come into compliance yes. with the basics of what any ledger account for a trading platform would have. Yes. Why don't we open it up to questions and discussion? We may have some online too, but are there questions here? Yes. Would it make sense for Chase to acquire Coinbase? <laughs> Well, I mean, I was, using that, really I was using the comparison of Coinbase to JP Morgan only in the sense that they're both using internal ledgers to keep track of customers' accounts. I'm not otherwise suggesting they're, they're the same uh, in any way or that they should be combined. So the point is simply that it's an it's a internal centralized ledger that's not not... Your, your account is not reflected on the decentralized distributed blockchain when you trade through Coinbase or any other just, platform. Just as, just as if you have securities at your Bank of America brokerage account, the, the actual record owner of those securities is not Tim Massett, it's Bank of America. And Tim has an entry in the Bank of America account. Uh, that how that entry is held and uh, how transfers are made and, and the like is the subject of rigorous regulation in order to avoid the types of things that you had happen at FTX. Question. Yeah, go ahead. One thing that's uh, kind of impeded adoption of crypto is that every transaction you make with it then is a, is a capital gain transaction to record in the report. Do you see that um, framework changing or any way to get around that so it could yeah. be used as a regular means of exchange? So let me explain that. So crypto assets are treated as property by the IRS. So that means if I were to use crypto to buy something, then I have disposed of the crypto. And so the IRS wants you to tell them then what was the price at which you bought the crypto and what was the price at which you disposed of the crypto and is there a gain? If there's a gain, then you have to pay tax on that. Yes. Um, so that's very different, obviously, than using cash <laughs> when I don't worry about that. But you know, there are people who think, well, we should at least have some de minimis exception. And there are bills in Congress that would propose that, some sort of de minimis exception. But I think that would require legislation. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is that uh, I think the main concern for the like centralized crypto exchange is nothing happened on the ledger and uh, Excel goes wrong. I understand all that. So is that, but at the same time, the uh, SEC is going after like DeFi or decentralized exchange. So that kind of uh, is an interesting dynamic. Uh, second question is that uh, Jay, you mentioned, uh, so a big part of it is about regulator want to bring crypto uh, trading into regulatory environment to protect and then bring custody, but isn't BTC ETF spot <laughs> is a kind of a potential solution because that can allow the you know retail to trade, but at the same time in a relatively safer environment, but somehow the regulator seems to be blocking it. Hmm. So let, let me... Let me answer the second question first, which is about an ETF product, which is ETFs are retail products. Institutions don't really, well, they can use, but anyway, opening up what I would call Bitcoin exposure to retail um, participants in a form that's easily accessible. So an ETF is more easily accessible than having your own wallet in, in order to invest in Bitcoin. Um, when I was at the SEC, I, I was concerned that the platforms that trade um, Bitcoin around the globe, um, trading was, the price could be manipulated fairly easily. So if you go back to 17, 18, 19, there were studies that said, you know, 90% of the trading in Bitcoin globally is really wash trading, really trading that's designed to create short-term movements in the price for one reason or another. My fear was that I was opening up the public 
to that kind of manipulated trading. Um, and I said, we're not going to approve a Bitcoin ETF until I can be comfortable that the level of illicit trading globally was low enough that you had a real price. That was my view. Um, after I left, uh, they approved a Bitcoin futures ETF. <laughs> um, I think the, th the theory was that trading in the futures was not being manipulated because it was regulated. Um, there, that theory is being tested right now. And it's being tested both ways. Now, did it, did it make sense to say that there's no, that there's no manipulation affecting the futures price? Maybe yes, maybe no. But if there's no manipulation affecting the futures price, well, then the cash market is probably okay. That, those are the two debates that are going on right now. I don't know what I would have done in 2021, but when I left, I wasn't yet comfortable that the trading platforms were uh, policed enough to say to, to effectively say to retail investors, you can. Now, I think embedded in your question is a futures ETF is a less efficient product than a cash ETF. That's that's part of that's part of the issue. Yeah. Yeah, and the you know the futures, the Bitcoin futures, and so forth were approved after I had left the agency. Under my tenure, we approved a Bitcoin swap, but that's different because the swap is only traded by um, large institutions. So we weren't as, as also just a different product. Um, but I, I think just taking a step back, what one of the questions that is now before everybody is, you know. Is, is Bitcoin going to be a product where we're going to allow retail participation and we're going to allow the market to decide? I think that, I think we're there. That, yeah. That's why I'm saying, exactly. I think we're already there. We're already there. Go back to 2017, so. when I think Tim and I were very much of like mind, said, if you want to do something about how Bitcoin is held and traded, you need to do it before 10 million, 100 million hold it. Because once they hold it and have decided that, you know, their individual choice is to hold it, it's hard to take it away. Yeah. And, and I guess I should make clear, some of you may not realize this. So we talked about SEC being the securities regulator, CFTC being the, being the derivatives regulator. That means it has authority over futures and swaps contracts, but not over the trading of the underlying commodity. That's very important to understand. So it's as if, you know, the CFTC can decide how cattle futures contracts, which people who deal in cattle industry, producers of meat, others might buy to hedge their price exposure and so forth. CFTC can say cattle futures Contracts have to be traded on a regulated exchange, have to be designed this way so as to not be subject to manipulation. But they can't say, and when you buy and sell cattle, this is the way you got to do it. As CFTC has no authority over that. So that's like Bitcoin. We can say, CFTC can say, Bitcoin futures have to look like this, but it has that doesn't give it any authority over the trading of Bitcoin itself. There is no federal regulator of the trading of that spot market trading today. And, and go back to my institutional retail dichotomy. You really haven't needed one because almost all cash trading in commodities is institution to institution. Now, you could put aside you know, gold, you could put aside a few things, but oil, you know, yeah. frozen concentrated orange juice. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And it's grown up over time, largely out of the agricultural industry. Yeah. Obviously, there's oil and minerals too, but often there have been, you know, industry standards that have kind of been developed over time because it's just purely. It's also, it's also global. Yeah. It's also global. Okay. Let's get to some other questions over here. Oh, okay. Oh. Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thank we'll you so much for being here. Um, you said earlier that you think that uh, tokenized dollars are earlier on the adoption timeline than other 
other parts of crypto. And I'm curious how you see that happening both in the private sector and the public sector. Do you see that as stable coins or tokenized deposits? And then on the public sector side, how do you see those being regulated? Um, so just just one person's view, and, and I don't have nearly the access that I had you know, a few years ago. I, I, I think that um, the stablecoin technology has, has proven incredibly scalable um, and remarkably global and remarkably stable um, when it's well constructed. So um, what I'm wondering is what, is what is the impediment to wide adoption of that? I really don't see it um, in terms of where we go next. And if it's if it's as programmable as smarter people tell me it is, you you ought to be able through regulation um, to achieve all the functionality that you would want to achieve from a CBDC. So, I mean, right now, other than cash, dollar holdings are essentially held through financial institutions who program those accounts much in the way we're talking about programming a stable coin. So I don't see it as a huge lift. I, I, I think one of the larger impediments will be there's a large cash economy, large cash economy outside the United States. How is that large cash economy going to transition to a digital dollar in stable coin or other form? That, that's an interesting question. Uh, and does that large cash economy contribute to dollar hegemony? Probably. So there's a, there's a little bit of a, you know, we're at the Kennedy School. There's a fairly significant public policy question around how we handle this transit. I think it's the biggest question in digital assets. How, how do you handle dollar denominated global trading in a transition to a digital currency world. Thank you both. This has been uh, stellar. Um, I was wondering how you conceive of or, or measure the economic significance of the crypto industry. Is it a matter of size of the assets, number of users, what have you? Obviously, the regulatory community is wrestling with the question of, kind of what is systemic now? And then secondly, what are the legal consequences of that? You spoke about the fact that agencies have brought a lot of enforcement actions at a certain point. If this industry gets so big, should they be looking more towards the regulation side? Well, let, let me let me answer that. I'll, I'll go broad to narrow. I'll go back to my comment. I think crypto is a technology, not a product. So the impact as a technology is potentially massive. Okay. Um, What's the what? Just let's just take the um, outstanding uh, dollar dollar credit around the globe. What is it? Sixty trillion dollars. If digitization of sort of dollar credit increases efficiency by five basis points, a hell of a lot of money. You know, every year five basis points on sixty trillion is a lot of money. Okay, let's then narrow it down to um, what people would call crypto products like Bitcoin and the like is, you know, where is it now a trillion dollars down from 3 trillion, maybe, maybe up today. What worries me more from a financial stability is how much leverage is in that. Now, I, think, I think a lot of the leverage has been washed out by recent events. So do I think Bitcoin holdings or the price of Bitcoin being volatile is somehow adversely impacting or has a potential adversely impact the global financial system? Not really right now. I don't think so. Like that's not a, believe me, there's a lot of other things that would keep me up at night before that. Uh, so now is the time to actually figure out what we're going to do about it. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's, how, that's how I look at it. Thank you so much for uh, coming. It's been really fascinating to hear your perspective. 
Full disclosure, I am on Coinbase's listings team. So first, I need to clarify that Coinbase is a public, a regulated company and publicly traded, and we do hold assets one-to-one. -one. We do not have a lot of the problems that a lot of other exchanges do. Just to clarify that, um, but yeah, I, I'm really interested in your comparison to Uber and how you know Uber, they aren't changing the way that we're driving. They still have seatbelts. They still have a lot of basics that we don't have to clarify. Um, on the listing scene, you know, uh, some guidance we've gotten is the Howey test that you mentioned, but there isn't that much more. So do you think that there's anything else that the SEC or anybody, any other regulators can help in defining what are the basics that we should be requiring, that we should be looking at, other than just the Howey test, that we could even start looking at proactively? Well, let, let, Sorry for the curveball. No, no, no. and, and let me say, I'm 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 now a practicing lawyer again, so I've given advice in this area and everything. But I try to try to be the you you know I try to be the same. Look, I don't think there is as broad a recognition, or there wasn't as broad a recognition as there should be, that the that the securities laws were drafted to be incredibly paternalistic. Basically, any extension of credit was the issuance of a security, and any, any, um, what I would say is instrument that you buy with an expectation of a return, presumptively a security. Now, let me give you the, that's of course taken to its extreme, too broad. The, the example that I gave, that I give to people is there is a line somewhere. So imagine, Imagine Tim and I are going to put on a Broadway production, okay? And, I, and I've used this before, but I think it's instructive. We go to all of you and we say, you know what? Each of you give us a thousand bucks and you're going to get a hundred tickets. Now, production may never get off the ground. We're going to give you a hundred tickets. We're going to go organize an orchestra, get a bunch of actors, writers, lights. And if we have a hit, those hundred tickets aren't worth 10 bucks they're probably worth 500 bucks. You've, you've made a 50X return on, on your investment. Let's say that happens. Those were securities when we gave them to you. You gave us money with the expectation that they might go up in value and you can really call them securities if we facilitated trading among this group. We, we helped you make a market, you're doing that. Fast forward, plays up and running, Somebody goes to the box office, buys a ticket for $500. It's just a ticket. It's not a security. So there, at some point there was a transition where it became just an item of utility as opposed to something that you held with an expectation of a return. That's very hard for people to get their head around because in both cases, it's a ticket to a play. In one case, it's a play that might happen in the future and it might be worth a lot. And in another case, it's a performance that's happening right now. But if we're going to protect people making an investment with us to, you know, we might run off to the Bahamas with the money. Right. We have to, we have to protect them there. They don't need the same protection when they're at the box office. And that's, that's the hard part of this. And we ought to just recognize that it's hard. We also ought to recognize that a hundred years ago, that transition did not happen as fast as it happens today. The ability to make a market among people was not as easily facilitated as it is today. So it's more, it's okay that it's more challenging today. Let's just recognize that's where we are and try and do something about it. Yeah. And, and I think it's fair to say that we both, neither of us is saying we don't have to get to that question. You know, we don't have to decide which are securities, but rather let's try to improve some basics first, or let's, the, 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 if we could simply improve some of these basics in investor protection, like custody, like preventing fraud, like preventing wash trading, um, that would go a long way and it would protect people. It would take some of the speculative air out of the sales of this industry. I think, frankly, the crypto platforms or a lot of the people in the crypto industry, including people at, at your company, I think would welcome that. Um, so 
you know, that's, that's, that's kind of what we're saying. Let's take stock of where we are right now, try to fix what we can now. We'll get to these harder questions later or in due time. Oh, or, or take, go, yeah, or going back to my, I, no, I agree with everything you said, going back to my metaphor or whatever you want to call it. Let's not decide where we go from pre-production to post-production and up and running. Let's have trading in those tickets be well policed through that, through all of that, at least to some extent, and then we'll figure it out. Yeah, John. Oh. Did you want to? Well. You want to follow up? Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Quickly on Sorry. with that. Sure. Um, so I. That's okay. Just I'll, I'll repeat your question. Yeah, I'm I'm actually here because I was here for the Harvard uh, conference. Thank you so much for speaking at that time. Oh sure. Um, and something you mentioned was you know we, or recognize that Coinbase just got the Wells notice. So as we are figuring all of this out and kind of defining things, why why do you see that strategy? Or I, I understand that these are things that are years in the making, and a lot of these are coming out just now for multiple reasons. But why do you see that as a productive way to kind of move things forward as we're figuring things out? The Wells Notice, you mean? Is, uh, is that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's your old agency? You should be. No. Um, look, if you're a regulator, your job is to enforce the laws as they're written. And I'm not going to comment on a on a on the particular action because I don't know, frankly, why they're issuing the Wells Notice. Um, but. You know, if I were in one of those jobs today, I would be looking at what I see going on and saying, hey, if I see something that doesn't comply with my understanding of the law and I have the resources and I can put the case together, I will go after it. It's up to Congress to tell me we're going to change the framework. That's how I would answer. I mean, I guess I'll add something. I would also maybe try to be a little more creative you know, and take up ideas like we put out, <laughs> yeah. which are basically things like, you know, the SEC and the CFTC should get together and try to come up with some common standards that could be applied to trading platforms. Yeah, John. Um, so I'm fascinated by kind of just listening to the conversation that on the one hand, there's a lot of discussion about how to regulate cryptocurrencies in the US, right? And then I think about, you, you know, you haven't touched on, for example, the Binance CFTC yeah. lawsuit. Right. right. And one of the things that I noticed, they're commenting how Binance has 120 entities around the world. Yes. Right. And, and the, the question I'm trying to figure out is, given the kind of virtual nature of these things that really don't kind of know geographic boundaries. Right. How do, is there any mechanism or any possibility of a coordinated effort to try to regulate these in some global well, way? Um, I mean, I know, yeah, yeah. I mean, just how is that going to play out? Because right well, now I mean, there's the, 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 to be a lot sorry. of geographic arbitrage, if you will. Yes, there is. But the fact of the matter is that there are a lot of jurisdictions moving faster than we are to regulate. And I think a lot of them would say, yeah, of course it has to be coordinated. Um, that's the only way it's really going to work. And in fact, Commissioner May Reed McGinnis, who's the European commissioner in charge of this, who's showing up here tomorrow and then speaking at the law school, I'm going to meet with her, uh, has said explicitly that. Said, we got to have this, you know, we got to have worldwide, you know, kind of cooperation to regulate this. It's the same thing that we did coming out of the financial crisis with over the counter swaps. That was an easier problem by comparison. But over-the-counter swaps weren't regulated. They contributed to the financial crisis. The G7 leaders got together, or G20 leaders got together, articulated some basic principles of how they should be regulated. Lots of countries then developed their own laws. Those laws were somewhat inconsistent, but they all kind of had those principles behind them. And then regulators like me and like Gary Gensler before, you know, when he was at the CFTC, worked very hard to try to harmonize all that. That's what's got to happen here. Yeah. I mean, I believe um, it has has to happen. I, I, I understand that. I'm just curious, and I really, this is not my area of expertise, right? So I'm just curious, like, is that likely to happen? And what kind of institutionally needs? Yeah, let me, let me make a point here. We talk about, unfortunately, we talk about crypto. And there is such a wide array of applications. Okay, so crypto as 
um, a, a technology for a securities offering, replacing paper or something like that, we're not gonna have international co cooperation. We regulate securities so differently from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, it's not gonna happen. Crypto as a payment mechanism or as a, a, a dollar-based store of credit, which is really all swaps are. Yeah. It's extensions of credit for yeah. exposure. Yeah. Will, should we have some um, international coordination? Uh, of course we should, because the extent it gets into the international credit and payments mechanisms, yes. Um, will we have the technology to deal with the problem that I talked about before, which is the ability of a US person to trade assets on an Amsterdam exchange, um, an Abu Dhabi exchange, or otherwise, that's another question and how we're gonna approach that. This, crypto has made that issue more stark than it has been in the past. But US investors, frankly, have not been that interested in buying shares of foreign companies on foreign exchanges. But I would say also in, uh, about the They Binance. may be more interested in buying crypto. I mean, about the Binance action by the CFTC. I mean, when you read the complaint, it wasn't just that they failed to have effective measures to prevent U.S. Let me back up. Binance is the biggest crypto exchange. You can, people around the world go to Binance to buy and sell Bitcoin and lots of other coins. And they were also trading futures products. The CFTC brought an action against them because finance was allowing U.S. persons to trade those futures project products. And if you're offering futures uh, products based on crypto, based on anything else to U.S. persons, you have to register with the CFTC, which they had not done. But the thing about what finance was doing was it wasn't simply that they failed to prevent U.S. persons from accessing the platform. It was that they were systematically and very deliberately kind of helping them access the platform. Yeah, and helping them hide it. So, you know, now that's just the allegation. We'll see what Binance's defense is. But, you know, that's the problem. I mean, we do have measures that, you know, prevent or at least make it very hard for US persons to access you know, unregistered offshore exchanges in, in other products. So I agree with Jay, we're not gonna harmonize everything. I think we're gonna see some, hopefully some similarity of standards, but there'll be some things that are different. Yes. Thank you. Um, if we go back to the scenario that you two have posited with some of your colleagues, as a workable solution that's interim and not necessarily so comprehensive as to never have you know, with the ability to move forward. Just positing that an entity that sort of acted like an exchange would register with the SEC or the CFTC or follow these various principles. So the CFTC and the SEC have to allocate their resources to figure out what to enforce. And um, so if the SEC, looking in this third bucket, which is following, not registered, following the um, Principles certainly in the in the first bucket, the SEC could enforce the registrants, and the CFTC could report enforce its registrants. And in this third bucket, how do you see enforcement, and and who it, how would it work if there was sort of token X, right? And the CFTC thought it was there's fraud and manipulation in token X. The SEC thought the same thing. And um, do you have yeah. a thought on that? Yeah, I don't mean to get too do. technical. Well, I mean, I think. Let me just back up so everyone's clear on what we're saying. So we're saying there are trading platforms out there in the world today. Instead of debating is what they're trading a security or a commodity, we say you've got to either register as a securities exchange, which none of them want to do, or as a derivatives exchange. Or if you don't do either of those things, you've got to follow these 10 principles that Congress is going to articulate protect customer assets, prevent fraud and manipulation, you know, have a have transparency, have reporting, you know, so on and so forth. And Congress would tell the SEC and the CFTC, you guys get together and come up with rules implementing those principles. Okay. 
So then the question is a very good one is, okay, but then what do you do? How do you enforce that? I think the most efficient way is for the SEC and the CFTC to create what we call a self-regulatory organization that would, first of all, develop those principles, those regulations. The agencies would approve them. It's not like telling the industry to go off and do it on your own, but we use, we have used since the very creation of the SEC, self-regulatory organizations to implement the securities and the derivatives laws. So they would develop those and then that SRO would enforce them. That's how I would do it. That, 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 that's one way. The other way is to recognize that this is an interim step. Yeah. And that at some point, registration with the SEC and or the CFTC is going to be required. Yeah. And that would force everybody to get together on the classification issues. But the question is, what do we what do we do for people who are out there now holding trading um, in order to make sure they have the basic investor protections? And maybe they have them already, but we should affirm that. Yeah, last last yeah, then yeah, this might be the last one. Let's see if anybody yeah. else has. Are there any online? Yeah, there ones Josh? have last question. Oh, there are. <laughs> oh, we've got a few online. Yes. Okay. Yeah, question. Uh, one more question about the FTX issue, because uh, I, I I really interested in your comment on the is in terms of volume, FTX wasn't that big because the company yeah. was thirty billion dollars something right. compared with any traditional market. Right, it's not major major, but I think I, I, I'm wondering was the response, but the coverage of the collapse was so huge that it's on top of every piece of a newspaper. So was it because it was branded as a was it because of what? Was it be because it was branded at very U.S.? Because uh, I guess part of it because U.S. founder and their big presence in U.S. All the football. Uh, <laughs> was, yeah. Was it was, it, was, it, was it was it was a big part of it? Or because Binance was never recognized as a U.S. exchange, right. but uh, FTX sort of. So people thought a lot of people thought it's U.S. regulator somehow. Fin financial press is not highly correlated with market capitalization. It's like what is what is, what is what is interesting to people in the so like if you watch CNBC or watch Bloomberg or whatever you know what air, what industry is covered all the time the airline industry the airline industry has a market cap of like nothing <laughs> but we all because we all fly we all we all like it it's really cool like it's really cool that we can go to London for the weekend you know like that is like the coolest thing in the world and who got a special bailout in the uh, pandemic. Uh, the airline industry. Right. Lots of people are employed, money. but I mean, they really did. But that's, you know, but no, I mean, look, Sam Bankman Fried was an incredibly charismatic, colorful char character. He, you know, he appears on TV and he's got the curly hair and he's in the shorts and the t shirt and all that. And he's worth $30 billion. And, you know, he's also preaching that he wants to be regulated and he's preaching effective altruism. And the entity had grown very quickly. And he was, in fact, trying to, you know, do things in the U.S. And finance, you know, is run by this guy who no one knows where he is. No one ever sees him. He doesn't come to the U.S. I mean, you know, the FTX story was made for the media. So. Online, anything? What have we got? Yep. Um, what are, are your thoughts on the newest SEC proposal around qualified custody? In particular, the section focused on qualified custodians maintaining possession and control of client assets at all times. Uh, this now would prevent the transfer of assets to centralized exchanges as client assets would not be maintained with a QC throughout the settlement of the trade. However, it would seem to open the door to enabling DeFi trading for QCs as they can maintain possession throughout the settlement. Is DeFi trading- Okay, now I think we got it. Got it. Yeah. So, so, so look, this person is obviously very sophisticated right. Uh, right. And, and, and recognizes that there is a question about how do you custody a digital asset in a way that qualifies as good custody for SEC rules. It's a question that has not been answered. Um, it is a question that I believe should have an answer. And you can start with if you have a security represented in digital form, what is good custody? You don't have to answer the sun, the moon, and the stars in the in the first instance. Let's let's yeah, let's although, 
there is with crypto there is the challenge of two people can have the keys i understand does that make it exclusive well, yeah what, what but these are details these are the, the but these are things that that going back to the fundamental question you know if you have a if you have a security represented in digital form how would you custody it okay go back to the fundamental question of are we going to allow people to hold bitcoin or not if we've decided we're going to allow them to hold it i think we ought to decide how a professional can hold it for them right Okay, next. Let's take one or two more. We see a comprehensive regulatory regime recently in Europe with Mika yeah. and in the New York State since 2015. Are these reasonable models to adopt at the federal level? I think that question, I'll go back to the point I made. That question is not a comprehensive, those models are not comprehensive models. So for some aspects of where crypto is being brought to the financial system, are they instructive? Yes. Are they comprehensive enough where would they, they, they would cover the CFTC, the SEC, the certainly, banking regulators? Certainly no. New York's. You know, no. Comprehensive. Mika, yeah. you know, you could, you could debate. Yeah. But look, I would say at least Europe is trying to come up with a comprehensive framework and there's a lot in there that I like. Um, I would have some differences, but it, more importantly, you got to start with where we are, right? You got to build on our system. Um, you couldn't just graph that onto our. I, I agree with you. There's a lot. There's a lot there that's helpful, right? Yeah. Okay. Last one. Yeah, last one. With IMF spring meetings this week, how should we think about the role of the U.S. dollar as a mechanism for global trade? Is there a duty from regulators to take regulation of U.S. markets as global? That's kind of a little beyond, I don't know, you want to answer that? I think it's... Uh... But the question is, is that too I, 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 Look, I, I, think it, I think it's a related question yeah, yeah. In, in that, going back to what I said, dollar hegemony has been the result of network effects, enormous network effects. If you want to maintain those enormous network effects, you better make sure that your network runs efficiently. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I mean, technology hasn't been key perhaps to dollar hegemony thus far. It's been more about the rule of law and the stability of the government and the size of the economy and the size of the treasury market. But in an age of rapid technological change, we got to at least be keeping up in some way. That's not to say that any particular thing is the solution, but rather we got to be thinking about the technology of dollar trade. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah,